honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitmore Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitmore Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitmore, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, editor of the Freeman and contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinct guest for this evening is the Honorable John Foster Dulles, United States Ambassador at Large. The opinions are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Dulles, you are known to all Americans as the chief architect and representative of the bipartisan foreign policy and as the man who's done most to shape the Japanese peace treaty. Now, my understanding is that uh, most of your official work in connection with that treaty is over, and that your present activities are mainly concerned with acting as consultants to members of the Senate who want to ask questions about the treaty. Is that about right? Yeah, that's about right, Mr. Hazlitt. We uh, worked uh, for a year negotiating the treaty. Then it was signed by 49 nations. Now we've had the hearings before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, we worked out a declaration that the uh, treaty does not in any way give effect to the Yalta Agreement, which some people feared might be the case. Uh, the treaty has been recommended by a 13 to nothing vote by the Foreign Relations Committee. Now to wait Senate action. I'm available to, for consultation with any senators who want to talk about it. Well, with a 13 to nothing vote from the committee, it looks as if the uh, prospects for endorsement, for ratification, are pretty bright. Well, I think so, too. I like to think so. But we've had good Senate backing all the way through because from the very beginning, I have felt that the senators should be brought in on the consultation with this, and we've had consultation from the beginning. It isn't the case to just bring him in at the end. Mr. Dulles, you have a splendid reputation for objectivity among most Americans, and I'm sure that our audience tonight would like your views on the general world situation. Now, sir, in your opinion, are we stronger this year as against Russia than we were last year? Uh, I think probably not. It's pretty hard to judge those things, but uh, my estimate would be that the tide is still running against us. Everywhere I look around the world, the question is what maybe we're going to lose next, you know, and uh, we seem to be on the defensive and that they're on the offensive. The question is, uh, what are we going to lose each year more than what are we going to gain? You can look around the whole circle of the world and you find one spot after another, after another, after another, where the question is, are we going to lose this bit of the free world? Is it going to be Iran or is it going to be Egypt or is it going to be Indochina or is it going to be Korea or what's it going to yes, be? Sir. Now, our people have, have, have been in this position for so long and it seems so hopeless and there's been so much negativism. Now, sir, do you see any way by which we can reverse this process so that we can gain hope again in America? I absolutely am convinced that we can do it. And, and how can we, we do it, sir? Well, we've been entirely negative in our approach. We've lost the good old-fashioned American dynamism. When we were a little nation and just were getting started, we stood for something that was so vital and so dramatic and exciting in the world that everybody everywhere wanted to follow our example. We were the dynamic force in the world. And then the despots were all wondering what they were going to lose next. And then you had a terrific despotism, again led by a Russian leader, uh, in, useful to remember, Tsar Alexander, was the great, most powerful potentate in the world. And his power stretched all around the world, down into Mexico, into uh, South America. And what happened then? The question was, what they were going to lose, and they finally were driven back, back, and back. We can recapture that American spirit. Well, Mr. Dulles, what specifically would you recommend doing, let's say, in China, to take a specific example? What do you think we ought to do concretely now uh, in regard to China? Uh, the first thing is to make clear, as I said, testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, that we have 
a positive policy that we do not accept as permanent this communization of the Chinese mainland. Good many people out there wonder about that. Uh, they're not quite convinced as to what our really intentions are. Many people who would be with us are lying low because they don't really trust our intentions adequately. We must clear up that doubt and make clear what our intentions are, then opportunity after opportunity will be created in my opinion. By such actions as uh, sending help to the guerrilla forces on the mainland and uh, giving further help to Chiang Kai-shek? I believe that we should give help and comfort to people anywhere, particularly in China, I don't say particularly in China, you're asking me about China, uh, who are resistant to communism. I don't think we want to have a war because a war is a thing upon which communism thrives and breathes. Uh, but we certainly can give the thing which is needed most of all is moral aid and comfort. Now you talk to these people, I've talked to some of them. You take uh, the, the uh, nationalists on the uh, Formosa. The thing they need most is moral support, more even than economic aid or even than material aid. We are giving a considerable amount of material and economic, uh, uh, military and economic uh, aid there. Uh, the thing that's lacking is a quality I would try to bring in, uh, which is more of a, a hopeful, purposeful spirit of dynamism. They want to be sure we're on their side. They want to be, they want to be sure we're on their side, and they want the, the moral comfort that comes with that. I, I believe it was Tom Paine who once uh, contributed the statement that the cause of America is the cause of mankind. You think it might be hopeful if we would start with a declaration that we Americans are going to aid the cause of freedom throughout the world again? I think it's uh, well time that we should make that clear again. As long as we stood for that in the world, we were on the offensive, the despots were on the defensive, we were secure. During that hundred years, there was no peril to this country. We've only begun to have our peril during the last 50 years when we've become rich and strong and fat and more interested in keeping the things we had uh, than in giving other people freedom. That's the danger point for us. Well, Mr. Dulles, I'd like to get back to some specific questions on this uh, Japanese peace <coughs> treaty. Now, one thing uh, that's been, uh, one question that's been raised is this. It's been feared that the Japanese will uh, very much need trade with China and because of this need for trade that they'll be tempted to recognize and deal with the Chinese communists. Do you have any comment to make on that? Yes, uh, the, uh, you've got 85 million people almost on Japan, pretty barren islands. They can't grow their own food uh, or their own material for clothing or anything of that sort. They gotta live somewhere. Now there are plenty of opportunities for them to live and to live well in trade with Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. They don't have to trade with China. They have not traded with China for the last five years to a month anything, and they've improved their economic condition tremendously. Now if the free world is irresponsible and cuts Japan out from all of their markets, then the Japanese will be faced with a hard choice. They'll either have to play along with communism or starve to death. They don't like communism. They hate Russia. They don't want to do it. And they will not do it unless, I think, irresponsible economic policies by the free nations virtually kick them into the arms of the communists. Mr. Dulles, you, once again, coming back to your reputation for objectivity, you've had perhaps the best chance to study uh, the results that we have attained in Japan through five years of occupation policy. Specifically, you studied carefully the record of General MacArthur. Now, would you like to give our audience your appraisal of General MacArthur's work in the Orient? Yes, I think that he did a perfectly amazing job in uh, Japan. There's never in history been an occupation which has been as uh, uh, fruitful as that was. He combined uh, magnanimity with, uh, uh, with justice. He gained the respect of the people, and he brought the Japanese people along very far, I think, on the road of uh, being genuine self-governing people. He introduced many reforms. Uh, talk about the land reform of the communists. The land reforms that MacArthur put through in Japan were infinitely superior to anything that's been done in the communist uh, uh, countries. And a uh, good bill of rights and uh, labor unions beginning to take hold. It's been an amazing uh, job. 
And he inspired this peace treaty. We never would have had this peace treaty that you talk about if General MacArthur, when I was over there with the Secretary of Defense Johnson, who was then the Secretary of Defense, and General Bradley in June 1950, it was the talks that we had there with General MacArthur and MacArthur's conviction uh, that the occupation had come to its uh, normal end and we should give the Japanese back their freedom and independence. That is the thing that inspired this peace treaty. You, uh, speaking of bar bipartisanship again, sir, you think that as a nation we might very well take bipartisan pride in what we did in, in Japan during those five years? It's a magnificent record that we can be proud of. Uh, Mr. Dulles, because we on this program hear so much that's not hopeful, I would like for us to come back again to this point. Do you expect that we Americans can do something hopeful, and do you think that we will do something hopeful for the world in the way of enunciating a new policy? I'm absolutely convinced, Mr. Hewitt, that we can't. We've been looking at this whole world picture through the wrong end of the telescope. We just see our own troubles, our own weaknesses, and the other fellow looks strong and solid and invulnerable. But if we turn the telescope around and look at it the right way, we would see the amazing resources that we have, the hope that we can inspire in people. We would see the oppression of the uh, despotism there, the fact that even within Russia there are 15 million people in, in captive prison camps. They only rule by terrorism. Why that situation ought to be a pushover. It would have been a pushover in the old days. Well, Mr. Dulles, I'm sure that our audience very much appreciates this hopeful message of yours. Sir. Thank you, sir, for being with us. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable John Foster Dulles, United States Ambassador at Large. The, with pleasure it is that we announce that Longines has been honored by appointment as exclusive official watch for the Olympic Winter Games at Oslo in Norway. Now this is the most exacting of all sports timing assignments, for the major events are, after all, all a contest between a man and a watch. Now this is an assignment which Longines undertakes with confidence. For the accuracy of Longines watches, like this Longines Olympic timer, like the accuracy of all types of Longines watches, has been demonstrated by the most exacting observatory accuracy trial. So to you who own a Longines watch and to you who hope to own one, the exciting Winter Olympic Games at Oslo will take on new meaning for their time with your watch, Longines, and no other name on a watch means so much. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Exclusive official watch for the 1952 Olympic Winter Games. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Wetnor Watches. This is Frank Knight speaking. This is the CBS Television Network.